Okay. Yeah, so uh, again, thank you for coming. This is our first meetup. Uh, without your participation, this wouldn't be possible. And, uh, yeah. Um, so originally, uh, to start off with, law should govern. Uh, before we get into smart contracts, Ethereum, or uh, Bitcoin, I wanted to paint a very broad picture for you, uh, just to keep it in mind. Um, and that is the classical liberal ideal of rule of law and not of rule of man. Uh, essentially, uh, they were describing a neutral framework of rules enforced impartially and justly, uh, providing for co cooperation without vulnerability uh, that would protect individuals from each other while enabling them to cooperate with each other. Uh, the more man is in this equation, the less neutral this framework becomes. Uh, the more probable we have the chance of either a rule of man or rule by law. Uh, this is where the state, uh, so this is where law becomes a tool for the state to suppress uh, in a legalistic fashion. Uh, I highlight this because the path we are taking here today uh, could literally le realize this rule of law ideal. Uh, more than anything the original classical liberals uh, could have possibly imagined, uh, whilst at the same time reducing the transaction cost of doing business. Uh, the contract. Uh, the contract is a set of promises uh, agreed to in the meeting of the minds. Uh, it is the basic building block of our market economy. Uh, the original right of contract is a key means of enabling cooperation. Uh, where almost any mutually acceptable arrangement could be made uh, binding uh, with the law serving as a mutually trusted intermediary uh, for securing this arrangement. The, con uh, the concept of the contract has evolved uh, with our culture and it has now been encoded into common law. Uh, despite the recent rise of the internet and electronic communications, uh, our institutions still take for granted that we live in a world of paper. We formalize our relationships with written contracts, written laws, and forms, of design, uh, forms designed for paper. Uh, and whilst these written contracts are highly evolved and capture the subtle intricacies of human relationships very well, they are costly to copy. Uh, not only that, they are passive and thereby costly to enforce, and uh, with written contracts, it is also cost, uh, costly to maintain a clear picture of past behavior of involved parties, uh, which is essential for high levels of trust in formal relationships. I should also state that we can't just redesign uh, the existing systems overnight, especially in developed countries with formal laws. Um, it is much better suited to do it in our small communities uh, and also perhaps look at developing worlds um, who still have informal laws as they're more flexible and more malleable to put into uh, a new kind of contract. Uh, this is also because these contracts encode complex human relationships. Uh, however, we are entering a period where we must adapt to our new internet media. So, smart contracts were originally coined by Nick Szabo in 1993, uh, although the idea has been around since the, uh, the 70s. Um, so, what are smart, smart contracts? Well, essentially, uh, these smart contracts are contracts described in code, uh, where the terms of the contract are enforced by the logic of the prog program's execution. With smart contracts... Oops, sorry. With smart contracts, the encoded rules themselves become the logic of their own enforcement. Uh, they are subject only to the honesty of the diverse market of co competing contract hosts, miners. Uh, they do not require judgment or skill of any specialists. Uh, this allows us to form a vastly stronger system of checks and balances in a trustless and decentralized manner. Smart contracts also gain the benefits of global transferability uh, without sacrificing any local knowledge. Uh, you can have a smart contract for Amsterdam and you could transfer it over to San Francisco uh, and it can be adapted there again. Uh, and you can do it for pretty much nothing. Uh, ch -ch -ch -ch. Um, involved, uh, involved parties also gain the transparency of past behaviours. Uh, 
provided by, in our case, the, the blockchain. Uh, smart contracts will dramatically reduce the cost of developing, maintaining, and securing our relationships. Uh, I should also state that smart contracts don't inherently make anything possible that was previously impossible, uh, but rather they allow you to solve the conflicts faster, uh, cheaper, and also with minimal trust. Uh, for the non-programmers out there, uh, there's an e-rights uh, site that uh, has a lot of uh, literature about smart contracts, uh, and they use the analogy of a board game. Uh, the players will design the rules of the game before they are willing to play, uh, and then once the rules are agreed on, uh, the game, the contract, will act as a board manager. This allows the players to move freely, but within the rules of the game. Most parties will not code their own custom contract either, uh, but instead it will probably from, be from a pre-programmed template, uh, and they will just fill in the blanks. Um, of course, custom, uh, these cu contracts can also be customizable. Uh, they may have been contributed by earlier parties, uh, and they, they'll probably be created by uh, specialists, something like a, a lawyer slash programmer hybrid. Maybe. <laughs> That's a very interesting combination. Yeah, <laughs> very. So, uh, vending machines. Uh, vending machines are a common example of uh, a primitive uh, smart contract. Uh, in a lot of the literature out there. Uh, I'm sure you're familiar with all of these, uh, but for those who aren't, uh, <laughs> a vending machine contract offers goods for currency uh, and does so by creating an inescapable uh, arrangement. Uh, this is by escrowing both drinks and payment uh, before dispensing either. That can be other goods as well. Uh, this inescapable arrangement re removes the reliance for the need of enforcement, uh, which we'll discuss in a second. Um, I should also note that coercion from the payer is also mitigated uh, by making the intrusion of the vending machine more costly than the contents of the, uh, the vending machine. So, uh, digital rights management. Interesting enough, I couldn't really find a positive image for uh, DRM, uh, but I did find some interesting images from Defective by Design. Um, DRM can be thought of a smart, uh, as a smart contract, uh, albeit a, poor, a poorly designed one. Uh, it attempts to apply property concepts to a digital good. Uh, however, it is hard to implement a reliable mechanism uh, of scarcity on a digital good. Uh, Amazon Kindle and uh, closed ecosystems such as the Apple App Store have had much greater successes in implementing this, uh, though it is still not foolproof. Um, for designs like Bitcoin and Ethereum, uh, scarcity has been robustly proven to work within its sphere of influence. Okay, enforcement. At this point, uh, for purely electronic assets like fiat money and stocks, we have more or less uh, an adequate picture and have seen how these could work, kind of work for physical assets in the case of the vending machine. Uh, However, control of physical assets is uh, determined not by their title listing, uh, but by the consensus of the governing community, us. Uh, the state actually has an advantage here. Um, part of its legitimacy comes from the coercive force, it, and it can use this apparatus to enforce the outcomes that they claim are legitimate. Um, and not, for the foreseeable future, certain types of contracts that deal with externalities uh, will still require this kind of support. Uh, a, coercive a coercive recourse is uh, still possible, but the costs are great. <coughs> However, we can look at the internet ecosystem. Uh, it also has no inherent coercive enforceability. Internet businesses have been engaging in rich and rapid experimentation with cooperative arrangements that require no coercive recourse. The most common of these is reputation. Uh, a few independent studies have shown that the most common arrangements found online do not involve actual escrow, but instead use reputation feedback and credit. This has a similar logic uh, in that a participant effectively secures their good performance with the value of their reputation capital. Uh, these arrangements substantially reduce capital costs, uh, however they are messier, 
uh, but they are made more possible with the flexibility, uh, cheaper transaction costs, and automation that smart contracts provide. The subtleties of the natural language in written contracts. Smart contracts may be unable to express uh, the subtle written, richness of contracts written in the natural language. Uh, this can be viewed as both a curse and a blessing. Uh, regardless, it will lead to techniques for combining the, the two kinds of contract elements into split contracts. Uh, in this case, smart contracts could be used to cover well-defined portions of the agreements uh, and then reference written contracts for other portions more open to interpretation and coercive enforceability. Uh, Nick Zabo uh, states that uh, complex lawyer-written paper contracts may no, actu may no longer actually represent the meeting of the minds. Uh, he argues that verbal agreements more plausibly uh, sorry, provide good sense of what each par party jointly intends to agree to. Um, I'll say that again. He, agree he argues that verbal agreements more plausibly provide a good sense of what each party jointly intends to agree to. Both parties have just had a rich conversational interaction full of conscious, subconscious cues uh, that we use to understand each other. The problem with these verbal agreements is our poor memories, in which people are turned to paper to record agreements. They trade away the richness and sincerity and vividness in order to get permanence. Zazbo's proposal is, uh, sorry, Zabo's proposal is it to embed a video recording uh, of the verbal agreements uh, into the smart contract. Uh, we could do this with a hash reference and then back it up with a BitTorrent or something. So, after uh, I've been yammering on all about that, what is Ethereum? In short, Ethereum is a distributed computation platform for running smart contracts. Uh, it is the brainchild of uh, Vitalik Buterin and uh, grew out of Bitcoin-based smart contract projects, Colored Coins and Mastercoin. It is currently a highly experimental project and intends to encapsulate the proposals and lessons learned from the past five years of Bitcoin running, as well as expand on the original ideas of Satoshi Nakamoto. Um, Ethereum can be used to codify, decentralize, and secure, and trade just about anything. Um, from voting domains, financial exchange, crowdfunding, company governance, intellectual property, and uh, even smart property. So what kind of contracts will we initially see coming out of Ethereum? Well, the first kind of contracts, uh, smart contracts we'll see will probably be financial instruments, uh, altcoins, and uh, ports of other experimental projects such as Namecoin. The most noteworthy is Actus. Uh, it's a project by the Stevens Institute of Technology and uh, funded by the, Alf uh, the Alfred Sloan Foundation. The goal of this project is to build a financial instrument reference database uh, that represents virtually all financial uh, contracts that link changes in risk uh, to cash flow obligations of financial contracts. Currently, this exists as 30 unique contracts. Uh, Charles Hoskin, uh, Hoskinson and the Ethereum team uh, have already been talking with uh, Dr. Willy Bramowitz, uh, exploring the possibility of having a single unified standard within the next year. Uh, if successful, Ether uh, Ethereum will be able to virtually represent any known financial instrument to date. Uh, looking further into the future, uh, we can see smart contracts embedded into the real world controlling property. Uh, this allows property to be traded with radically less trust, uh, reducing fraud, mediation fees, and allowing trades to take place that otherwise would have never ha happened. Uh, primitive forms of smart property are already common, um, as they already exist in hotels and uh, office locations. A room or workspace is controlled by a keycard lock. Uh, the door checks uh, uh, to see if whether the user's keycard is already valid and uh, either denies or allows entry, uh, depending on their contractual transaction. Um, immobilizers are another example of smart property. Uh, similar to hotels and offices, they uh, augment their physical key with a protocol exchange 
ensuring only holders of the correct cryptographic token can activate the engine. Uh, they have dramatically reduced car theft, for example. Uh, immobilizers are fitted around 45% of all cars in Australia, uh, but they only account for 70% of cars that are stolen. Uh, the shortcomings with these primitive smart properties is that the private key is usually itself held in a physical container and therefore can't easily be transferred or manipulated. A smart property changes this, allowing ownership to be intermediated by the distributed contract hosts or the Ethereum network. Ethereum is still a proof of concept stage, uh, but together we can build something truly remarkable a sort of Bitcoin 2.0. Uh, I hope this talk has raised your understanding and outlined some of the benefits of smart contracts. And if not, uh, please follow these links for further reading. Uh, they're authored by much, uh, people much smarter than I am. And uh, Mike Hearn's got some really good talks as well. So I, I recommend checking it out. All right. Well, thank you very much for listening.